psychiatrist, and he said, every time I drink my coffee, I get a stabbing pain in my right eye. And the psychiatrist, well, have you tried taking the spoon out of the cup? <laughs> it has something to do with it. So in Exodus, we see Moses being called at the burning bush. At the time, he was only a shepherd. He wasn't prepared, and he, he resisted the call. But then he relented, and he accepted the call of God to leave the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. Then in Leviticus, God instructed Moses on all the laws and the instruct, worship instructions, very detailed things, uh, that, the way God wanted things. But in Numbers uh, chapter 11, the people are getting sick and tired of this manna which according to the descriptions must have been pretty good taste in stuff. They said it had a little, like, tasted like honey and coriander seed. You know, they said it must have been pretty good, but they were tired of this and they said, give us meat, we want meat. And if we skip down to, number, to Numbers chapter 11 and verse 13, he's, he's complaining now to God because they're, they're so against his leadership and he says to God, Moses says to God, where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing. Give us meat to eat. Picture now, there's 600 and some thousand men of what they call a military age, plus women and children. So there's probably at least a million and a half, could be three million people wailing at one guy, give us meat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. Have you ever had a burden that would just seem like it was too hard? Have you ever been like that? In verse 15, this is how you're going to treat me. Please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. This is a low point in Moses' life. He was so desperate that he wanted to die. You ever been that way? So desperate, he wanted to stop the planet, I wanna get off. You ever been that way? Verse 16, the Lord, this is his reply now. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders, and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. Now you got a picture, the tent of meeting wasn't in the camp, it was a little ways away from the camp. It was separated, but he was to bring 70 to the tent of meeting. Verse 17, I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So God is going to take care of this problem that Moses is griping to God about in his desperation. He's crying out for help and God is going to, to do, he's gonna help. And you go down to verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said he brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again, which I think is kind of interesting. They did not do so again. Verse 26, however, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. The spirit rested on them right where they were, but not with the other, let's say 68 that were around the tent. So God, of course, he knows where everybody is. He knows they were there. He knows they were chosen. The spirit rested on them. And when that happened, 
a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied in verse 29, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them all. So here we have a picture of all these people, of the camp, of the tent of meeting, God was there. Moses was there. There were only Moses and Aaron and his sons were supposed to be around that camp, uh, around that tent. But they keep wailing. He said, I cannot carry these people by myself. They had rebelled at the mountain of God. They had complained about lack of water. They complained about lack of food. And now they were demanding meat. Moses wanted to die. Everything seemed to be going wrong no matter what he did, no matter what God did or came through, these people were never satisfied. And he had, had finally enough of it, and he's complaining to God. He was only a shepherd, you know. He didn't take the role of a leader for himself. He accepted the role. He hadn't chosen it. Everything he did successfully was done with God's help, under God's authority, and with God's anointing. Some of them were rebellious, these people. He couldn't control the people. He couldn't control them. And some of them were repeatedly <clears throat> rebellious. He was responsible for two or three million people. There were stiff-necked people in God's own description called them stiff-necked people. The difficulty of managing all those people, actually a whole nation, was way too much here for only one man. He was so desperate, he wanted to be dead. So then we look at God's compassion. God cares about the leaders that he appoints. He just doesn't say, go and do this. His care rests on them and remains on them. God's leaders don't always have an easy path to walk. It's, it's not easy. Satan didn't want Moses to succeed. Satan didn't want the will of God to be followed. He never does. Satan didn't want there to be a nation of Israel to exist. The Messiah would come from that nation. And the Messiah would be Satan's nemesis. Anyone who does the will of God faces opposition. Moses faced opposition, huge opposition, people wailing. To us, the opposition looks like it came from the people. But who or what caused the people to be in rebellion? Wherever God is moving, the enemy is trying to ruin God's work. Amen? God's people, that is, those who do his bidding, always have God's presence with them. Sometimes we don't know that he is there, but we have assurance that he's there. If you're in God's will, and if you're doing his bidding, then you will face times when it sees, seems like you are alone in your ministry. But I assure you, you are not alone. God's love and compassion are always with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, he said. Sometimes we get into a dark place. Moses was in a dark place. He wanted to be dead. God's compassion came to him with a solution. God always has a plan. <laughs> yeah, we got the, hug, the buzz out of it. So here comes the plan in verse 16 and 17. Bring 70 elders known to you to be leaders and officials. Known to you. Moses was to choose people who would assist him. He was to choose them. He was to do the choosing. 
He didn't know all 630,000 men plus women and children, but he was to choose 70 people that he knew. And he was to choose assistants that he knew would have leadership quality. So he must have known some of them pretty well, but some are equipped by God to be leaders. Some are leaders that shouldn't be. You don't have to look very far to see leaders that don't have the interest of the people at heart. Think about Jim Jones, for instance, and there are others. So Moses was to search for leaders who would cooperate with him in leading the people to the land that God promised. They would also help with discipline and making sure that the people knew what God required. Moses would choose assistants who were officials among their own clans. They would be respected already, and they already had some standing among the people. And in verse 25, God took some of the power of the spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders as a sign they prophesied. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know exactly what that means. I have an idea what it means. But apparently, they were uttering something. They were saying something. Prophecy, is a, the way I think of it, is a declaration inspired by the Holy Spirit about something that's going to happen. A prophecy, as we think of it, is about a future event in the church if the utterance is about something that's currently happening that is a word of knowledge not a prophecy but sometimes people in the church have gift of prophecy and they can utter something about something that will happen something sometimes it's an encouragement so could it be that this prophesying is the same as happened to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse 4 to 6, it says, it says, this is they were speaking to Saul, they will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. I think this was Samuel speaking to Saul. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there's a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with liars, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. What could that word prophesying and prophecy, what could that mean? Does that mean all those people were declaring something that's going to happen all at the same time? Doesn't make sense, does it? Does it? Well, we're going to find out how it could. No, not in that way. In verse 9 to 10, 1 Samuel 10, 9 to 11, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. That's a sign right there that the Holy Spirit has come over him. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of the prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? So I don't know what these people the 70 elders that were with Moses. I don't know in Numbers chapter 11, I don't know what they were doing that's referred to as prophecy. But it happened as the Holy Spirit came on them and it says at least the 68 didn't do it again. Now this is interesting. Rabbi David Frankel is a rabbinical scholar. He's a professor, Dr. Frankel, in Israel. He teaches uh, rabbis um, from the Hebrew, from the Old Testament. And he's commenting on this particular event. And he says this, 
Everything seemed to proceed as planned. Moses gathered the elders and placed them around the tent of meeting. God came down in a cloud and spoke to Moses and conferred some of the spirit that was on Moses onto the elders. The elders immediately, now here's a Hebrew word, hit nabu. He puts, quotes, prophesied or spoke in ecstasy, clearly as a result of the sign of their newly acquired spirit. Just then, however, a new development is reported. Two men, Eldad and Medad, and he's just uh, quoting this as spoke in ecstasy in the presence of the people when Moses was away and far out of sight. Then he gives, he gives the, this is in the Hebrew uh, alphabet, the Hebrew characters here, Numbers eleven twenty six, And he's, he's, he's translating directly from the Hebrew. And he says, now two men named Eldad and Medad remained behind in the camp and the spirit rested on them. They were among those who had been enrolled, but they did not go out to the tent. And they spoke in ecstasy inside the camp. Whatever it was, it was a confirmation that God was with them and that the Spirit was on them. <clears throat> but it seems to me by this scholar and that there's a, another way to, to translate that word prophesy and that it was speaking in ecstasy. In other words, as the company of prophets was coming down with Saul, with instruments ahead of them, they were just declaring the praises of God in an ecstatic, excited, Pentecostal kind of way. Follow what I'm saying? And that's what they're referring to, speaking in ecstasy as prophecy here. So then Eldad and Medad were part of the 70 who were chosen by Moses. Why didn't they go out to the tent? We don't know. Maybe they were in the middle of dinner. <laughs> kind of doubt it. Maybe they didn't see themselves as worthy to be among the chosen 70. Maybe they had duties in the camp that couldn't be accomplished quickly enough. Maybe like Moses, they didn't feel adequate for the task. Maybe they thought, we're not really you know, up to that. So they stayed behind. But God got them anyway. The two also had a visitation of the Holy Spirit with the same utterances, with speaking in ecstasy as Rabbi Frankel translates it. He doesn't translate it as prophesied. He's translated as speaking in ecstasy. As the other 68, God isn't limited to a particular location. God isn't limited to the attitude of the people that are chosen. He chose Moses, and Moses didn't have a good attitude about it. I didn't have a good attitude about being a minister. I didn't want to do that. God had to change my mind about it. He had to convince me. Moses was authorized to choose those who would help him. God honored his choices by applying the Holy Spirit to even those who didn't come to the tent. God said, choose 70, and he honored Moses' choice by anointing 70, even though two of them weren't there. God isn't limited. He's not limited. And the Holy Spirit was applied even to those who didn't come to the tent. God isn't limited to a tent, or to a cloud, or a pillar of fire, God is sovereign in all things. He's not limited to our expectations. He isn't limited to anything. Matthew Henry, referring to this, says, but the Spirit of God found them in the camp, and there they exercised their gift of praying, preaching, and praising God. They spake as moved by the Holy Ghost. So this young man who ran, whenever the spirit, whatever that utterance was, and it was speaking in ecstasy, that's what it was. It was heard, it was noisy, it was excited. And it was heard around the 68 that went to the tent. 
and the utterance was heard by those in the camp because that's where Eldad and Medad were. If they all heard it, I don't know. Millions, I kind of doubt it. But the ones around there did, and it was probably loud and noisy. But the gift of God found them, the Spirit of God, in the camp. And there they exercised their gift of praying, preaching, and praising God as the Holy Spirit came over them. And this young man, he, he heard that, but he was probably nearby where Eldad and Medad were. And he heard this unusual utterance and he ran to tell Moses about it. He ran. And he was no doubt part of the clan of Eldad and Medad because they, clan they camped according to clans. What they heard was so unusual that it was alarming to them. So alarming that he felt bound to alert Moses about it. This young man probably had seen the destruction that God had brought, both in Egypt and those among the Israelites who had been rebellious. And in, in his youth, he may have thought that these two were in rebellion. This young man may have thought they were in rebellion and they were gonna bring some disaster upon the, upon the camp. But Joshua, he could have been one of the 70 that was called. He certainly seems qualified, but we don't know. But he urged Moses to stop them from doing their prophesying, whatever that was, you know, and Joshua was probably alarmed. He may have thought the Spirit would only come on those 68 who cooperated and came to the tent of meeting. He may have thought that they were in rebellion. Some may have thought that God would bring judgment because of it. And Moses' response in verse 29, but Moses said, are you jealous for my sake? Moses had a perception that Joshua was jealous of those two. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So Moses reprimanded Joshua for his, I would call it legalism. Moses wishes that all the Lord's people would have the spirit of God on them. If it were so, he wouldn't have to confront so much rebellion. So in Exodus 33, 12 to 14, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. He had promised way back in Exodus that my presence, in other words, my Holy Spirit will go with you and I will give you rest. M Moses must not have remembered when he was wanting to die that God's promise was the presence and the rest. So Eldad and Medad were in God's favor. God wouldn't visit a power of the Spirit on them if they weren't in God's favor. The other 68 were in God's favor. They were all in God's favor. The Holy Spirit came unto all of them. They all spoke in ecstasy. God's promise to Moses was accomplished. God was with him and God gave him rest. And nowadays many so-called denominations preach the word. There are people who get saved in other churches than our own. The word is there. The word doesn't return void. Any church that has a Bible at its core can get people saved, even if that's not their principal drive, which some, which some it's not. We could be like the young man. We can be like that. And we can be like Joshua, thinking that our way is the only way. 
Some churches had a lot, have a lot of formalism. They call it liturgy. Liturgy and vestiture, you know, the preacher wears robes and all this stuff they put on. And, and they have liturgy, an, an order of everything that they do. But liturgy, liturgy, and, liturgy and vestiture veils the gospel. But they don't render the gospel ineffective. The, words, the word is still there and it doesn't return void even though it's veiled sometimes with man-made stuff. <laughs> My mom grew up in a Lutheran church, which was very formalistic. They had liturgy. And, but she was the most devout, God-fearing, God-loving person imaginable. She would come after me sometime. And I'd say, Mom, quit your preaching. My dad was Catholic. They were really, really vestiture, but Quit preaching to me. But there are born again believers in the Catholic Church. Not because of the church, but in spite of the church, because of the word. I've known born again Presbyterians. I once examined uh, the doctrine of the Anglican Church. Yep, salvation is right there in the doctrine. People in fundamentalist churches like us, tend to think they're the only ones who carry the gospel effectively. We fundamentalists probably carry it more effectively because we know that's our purpose. But let's not be like the young man. Let's not be like Joshua was. Let's not look at people in other churches or denominations and think that we're superior to them because we're Pentecostal. Let's not do that. Methodism came about in Britain as a return to basics, as a return to just basics, because the church had become more about the church than it was about the gospel. But the doctrine was still there. It was just veiled by all the formalism. Seekers after God will be found by God. The gospel first came to Phillipsburg with a Lutheran minister. He was one of those, I think 13 maybe, that the Phillips family in England wanted to have a colony here. And they advertised and gave each one some, a, a lot in the town and some ground on the outside so they could grow stuff. And he was one of those, a Lutheran minister. It first came to Phillipsburg with a Lutheran minister. Then a circuit riding preacher came along through here and the circuit riding preachers were Methodist and then the holiness movement came out of Methodism the Pentecostal movement came from the holiness movement but they were all getting people saved today's churches have too many walls around them we're this and we're that we got this name we got that main how about if we're just all Christian? How would that be? Christian believers. Jesus is Lord. You have to accept him and, and believe in him as Lord and Savior and then live for God. How about we're Christian and we want you to be too. The 70 were all chosen. El dead and me dead for some reason couldn't be there. They didn't come. So God appoint, anointed them for service right where they were. They didn't accompany the other 68, but they were with them anyway. By the power of the Holy Spirit, it landed on them as it did on the 68. They didn't go there, but they were with them in the Spirit anyway. And the young man and Joshua didn't respect that they could be blessed by God in another place. So Moses had it right. Of course, there are some fellowships that are cultish and way out of the will of God because they're way off of Scripture. You can tell if a fellowship is, is correct or not because they, if they have roots in the Scripture, and some do not. There are churches now 
that are embracing sin, that are carrying a counterfeit gospel, have nothing to do with them. But we shouldn't be quick to put walls around our own fellowship. The bottom line, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 17, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what is fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there be between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing and I will receive you. I have been in Catholic churches where I could feel the power of the Holy Spirit. You might think that's impossible. Maybe you need to reorient your thinking. God can be wherever he wants to be. But I, but I remember a, a church in Peoria, and I was in there photographing weddings and different things, and they had a charismatic priest in there. He wasn't the pastor, he was just one of them. But you could feel the power of the Spirit when you went in there, the Catholic Church. Legalism pushes people away. Joshua was being legalistic. They can't do that. Stop them. They, they're not where they're supposed to be. He was being legalistic. We can't set rules for God. <laughs> God had, had everything under control. Joshua, he had a hard time accepting that God could do that. Eldad and Medad were in God's will, evidenced by the power that came over them, the same power that came in and came on to those around the tent of meeting. The excited utterances called prophecy in the English translation. The young man didn't have all the answers. Lean not unto your own understanding. The word of God is our all-sufficient rule for faith and practice. Some fellowships have departed from the word and had their own understanding, their own way or, or way or, or of thinking or, or doing things or advising people, and they're leading people astray. But a church or a movement has to have the word as its core. When they stray into their own understanding, they stray away from God. The Pope has okayed same-sex marriage. When social standards, which change all the time, become the standards of the church, then the church or movement is on the wrong side of God. In our text, Joshua was on the wrong side of God. When we see a guy with his hat on in church, we have a negative reaction. You're not supposed to wear a hat in a building. Show me where it says that. <laughs> Show me. But we have a negative feeling about it based on social standards. Or if we see somebody, you know, um, leading worship that has a hat on, God forbid has it on backwards. We hate, to, we hate to see that. We do hate to see that. Show me where it says you can't have your hat on backwards. Show me. But that's our understanding. When we set those standards and think we should apply them to everybody, we can't do that. It's God's standards and this is God's standard. The social concerns are our own understanding. Show me in the New Testament where it says I shouldn't smoke a pipe. I don't, but show me where it says that. I think you could, I think you could find 
reasons uh, be, that defile the body, if you're doing something that could cause you cancer, like smoking cigarettes is gonna give you a heart attack or cancer. Smoking a pipe, you don't inhale it, but you could get tongue cancer from it. But I don't do that, I did years ago, because there's a different standard. If I, if I smoke a pipe and somebody sees me doing that, he's a, he's a preacher, he can do it, I can do it, and they get throat cancer. That's on me, so uh, you have to be careful. Show me where it says that we should be hush-hush and never speak in church. We were taught by the penguins <laughs> that we should be hush-hush in church. The, the nuns taught us that in the Catholic school. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Never, never say anything in church. Don't raise your voice. Be very quiet in church. Because God's in the tabernacle. They, they keep God in a golden box on the altar. That's where God is in, in, but you can't make any noise in there. Remember that? I spilled my crayons one time and I thought God was gonna kill me before I got them all picked up. <laughs> that was about third grade. So show me where should, where should be hush hush in church. We go around greeting each other and everybody's talking and that, that's a, that's a happy noise. God wants us to be happy. We have, we have the Spirit of God in us. So I could go on and on about man-made rules in churches, and there was a lot of legalism in Church of God and Assembly of God at one time. I mean, <laughs> an example is at one time, women weren't supposed to wear pants in church. And they weren't supposed to wear earrings or makeup. Some preachers preach against makeup, you know, and against women wearing pants in church. And there were some AG churches like that. And I think some Church of God churches, same way. Show me. <laughs> we had a friend, a good friend. She said, I need to talk to you. This was, there was no pastor. I was, I was leading the board and leading the church as a as sort of as an interim pastor well, until we got a new pastor. I need to talk to you. Okay, so I sat down with her and she had a thing about another woman and the other woman had a little tiny piercing in her lip right here. Well, I don't think she should be able to do this or that because she's got that piercing. I said, what are these things in your ears? Oh, that's different. Show me. <laughs> I said, no, it's not. That's a piercing, a, and her, your earrings are bigger than the thing on her lip anyway. So what are you talking about? We're guilty if we do that. And we're guilty if we fuss at people over our own, over our own understanding and fuss them out of the church. That's true. That's true. I could go on about man-made rules. It was a time when, and I just read about this. I never saw it. Uh, was before my time, but women were supposed to have stockings that had seams in the back. If their shirt or skirt was short enough that you could see their stockings, then it had to have seams in the back, or it looked like they had bare legs. Did you ever hear of that, Nancy? Did you ever hear of that? You can you you can remember that. Well, now pantyhose doesn't have any seams in the back, so they're all going to hell because there's no seams in pantyhose. Show me. It's ridiculous. But we fuss at people about silly things. Silly things. Just silly. Can we agree that God knows what he's doing? <laughs> Can we agree that God has everything under control? Can we agree that social norms are sometimes based on just prevalent attitudes and not necessarily on scripture. Can we agree that God's will is where we need to find ourselves instead of our own perceptions or our own attitudes or our own ideas? Some of those attitudes and ideas are absorbed from our parents and grandparents or from the social standards of the communities we live in 
or what we see on the internet or the television or Fox News. It needs to come out of here. Amen? Could you, would you stand? I'm done talking now. <laughs> That's why I finished my sermons. Well, I'm done talking now. Honestly, I preached this sermon in here before, a couple years ago. But that story pops up every March. Then in my one-year Bible I read, in March is where the, when the story pops up. And I thought, well, that's a good sermon. And I found out I preached it a couple years ago. But you guys don't remember that. <laughs> Carol didn't remember it. Of course, neither one of us has a good memory anymore. But I do recycle a sermon from time to time. And we can do that. It's okay. It's a, it's a good word. There's nothing wrong with recycling it. Amen. Okay, Father God, I love these people. These are my people. These are my precious family. I love every one of them. And I pray your Holy Spirit will reside with all of us, Lord, until we come again together. I pray, Lord, that you would give us all opportunities, all of us, to be your ambassadors carrying the word this week, that we run across people that we can bless with your word and maybe lead some of them to the Lord and maybe even bring some of them in here. That would be a blessing. So thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you for their attentiveness. Thank you for their love. Thank you for the spirit that's in them, Lord. We just ask you to keep us all safe till we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Adios, amigos. <laughs>